President Trump has reportedly been speaking to key witnesses about their conversations with special counsel Robert Mueller. And there's the news that Russian President Vladimir Putin lavished praise on Trump, President Trump, in newly released interviews. Is it part of an attempt to treat Trump like an intelligence asset? Well, good person to ask about that is CNN's national security analyst James Clapper, the former director of national intelligence. Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, director, the New York Times is reporting tonight that Robert Mueller's team now knows of two conversations in which the president asked uh, Russia investigation witnesses, including his former chief of staff, Reince Priebus, and White House counsel Don McGahn, about their interactions with the special counsel. What's your reaction to that? Well, it's I, first, I think it reflects... Uh, intense concern on the part of the president and probably rightfully so in uh, you know where special counsel Mueller is going and what questions he's 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 asking maybe even a paranoia about it um, you know I don't know uh, I'm not a lawyer don't know if this rises to uh, tampering with a witness I guess not after the fact but once again not a very good optic yeah and that seems to be the pretty much what the consensus from most people I've spoken to today. What about the new scrutiny on this mysterious meeting between uh, informal Trump advisor Eric Prince and a Russian banker close to Putin, possibly to set up a back channel to Russia? Uh, as an intelligence guy, what stood out to you about this? Anything? Well, this is just another example of this uh, surreptitious, uh, you know, cops and robbers, Inspector Clouseau stuff which is completely unnecessary if, in fact, you know, the dialogue was going to be legitimate. There's really no reason to set up a secret back channel because there's, a, there's been a history where transition uh, president-elects and, and administrations-to-be reach out to uh, foreign contacts and foreign interlocutors. And if it were done openly and above board, and the, the last administration would have been pleased to have assisted this if, it, in fact, it were legitimate and above board. But this, again, is a, a, is a bad optic, in my view. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe there wasn't anything uh, nefarious discussed, but it certainly didn't ha doesn't have very good appearance. Director, the president was asked about Russian interference in the 2016 election yesterday. This is what he said. Well, the Russians had no impact on our votes whatsoever, uh, but certainly there was meddling and probably there was meddling from other countries and maybe other individuals. And I think you have to be uh, really watching very closely. You don't want your system of votes to be compromised in any way. And we won't allow that to happen. We're doing a very, very deep study and we're coming out with some, I think, very strong suggestions on the 18 election. So, Director, at least three intelligence chiefs say they know nothing of any specific plan to deal with Russia. Is it possible that they'd be out of, of the loop on any such deep study? Uh, very unlikely. Uh, and why are, we, why are we studying this 14 months away from when all this happened, you know? Uh, so that's kind of an incredulous statement. And as well, <clears throat> for him to suggest that, it had, you know, the meddling had no impact, really stretches uh, credulity in the sense of trying to give him the, you know, do the best I can to give him the benefit of the doubt. We did say in our assessment that we saw no evidence of meddling with voter tallies, but that's, he's conflating that to try to give the uh, impression uh, or the assertion that the meddling had no impact. When you consider that the election basically turned on less than 80,000 votes in three states, which key, three key states, which were targeted, by the way, by the Russian effort, uh, I think it really stretches credulity to suggest that no voter decisions were changed. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it wasn't anybody else. It wasn't China. It wasn't the 400-pound guy in his bed in New Jersey. It was Russia and nobody else. Yeah. You have spoken before about how you think that uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin appears to be treating our president as an intelligence asset. What do you see that, that makes you say that? Well, first, I, I, I need to say I meant it figuratively, but <clears throat> remember Putin's professional background. He's a KGB agent in the heyday of the Soviet Union. And so 
that's the way he, gen I think he instinctively approaches, particularly another head of state. And so he, the way he thinks about this is how do I co-opt this guy? How do I influence him? How do I gain his favor? Well, I think Putin's figured out that if he plays to President Trump's ego, he can, uh, he can influence him. Yeah. And the president's deference to him and his apparent admiration of an autocrat like Putin, a, a corrupt one, by the way, uh, you know, just further gives, in my mind, it just suggests to me that he, Putin, approaches how he handles and how he manages his interactions with President Trump as though he were a potential asset. Yeah. Before I let you go, uh, I just want to switch gears here and just get a quick thought on where we are, uh, where things stand now with uh, North and South Korea. Well, you know, I'm glad you asked me that, Don, because one of the things that concerns me is somebody that's followed developments on the Korean Peninsula ever since I served there for two years uh, as <coughs> Director of Intelligence for U.S. Forces Korea is that all, with all our preoccupation with chaos in the White House and, you know, paying porn stars not to talk, <clears throat> we may be losing a crucial opportunity here that may not happen again to really change the dynamic on the Korean Peninsula. And the recent developments with uh, Kim Jong-un receiving a delegation so from the South uh, his willingness to talk, if, if as it's been reported by uh, the Koreans, if that's accurate, uh, this is a profound opportunity for us, which I hope we don't, doesn't get lost in, in, uh, in, with all these uh, distractions. Mm -hmm. And I would hope, although I doubt we're doing it, that we're taking the long view here. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, you know, what is it that's motivated the North Koreans to acquire a nuclear weapons capability? Right. Well, it's fear of the United States. Right. So one of the demands they made to me when I was there, which I think still stands, is to negotiate a peace treaty. Because all we have right now is a ceasefire where, you know, 65 years ago on the 27th of July, 1953, everybody stopped shooting at each other. Yeah. And, that so, for, and so from the North Korean perspective, they just see you know, the forces arrayed uh, against them as on a hair trigger, ready to invade and overturn the regime. And we have a, we have a chance to change that, that dynamic. Right. We've been there for 68 years. At some point, we need to decide when can the South Koreans defend themselves. And if we slowly and incrementally and, and, and thoughtfully w reduced our presence in North Korea and, re and remove the, the abject fear they have of us, we could easily change the, the dynamic. And we're certainly, even now today, we're in a much better place than we were a few months ago where we're uh, on the cusp, rhetorically at least, of a cataclysmic war.